Thank you very much, Susan, for helping us get aligned. We are going to begin, and as others get in, they'll get a chance to join us. We've got a full agenda today, as a, I'm anticipating we're going to have full agendas for a while. As we're standing this committee up and getting things going, let me again express my appreciation to each of you <clears throat> for, billing, for being willing to jump into this space and taking on this risk. I talked at length about that last time. I will not, I promise, uh, do it this time as we talk around the values and the importance of the values related to this work. The values are going to become central to all that we do, and so you're going to see them on a regular basis. For those who are listening and do not know who I am, I'm Dr. Stephen Holt and uh, Lee Tri Excellence. We are the uh, consultants on this work and then the facilitators of the Executive Steering Committee, myself and Eric Warren. And we're glad you're in this space today. We've got quite the agenda, as I mentioned, and so uh, Susan's going to walk us through uh, some of the uh, back end kind of things. So Susan, I will put it in your hands. Thank okay. you. Yes, we're going to do a quick, uh, quick Zoom review. I know people are very experienced in this, so we will touch it quickly. Uh, there are two things though I want to note right here. One is that we had anticipated live streaming this meeting and we were successfully live streaming it last time. Uh, Zoom is having some technical difficulties with that interface. Uh, so we are not live streaming right now. We are recording, however. So please uh, be aware of that. And at the very least, we will post this um, recording uh, to the website after the meeting. So I want, want you to be aware of that. Uh, real quickly for Zoom review, if you do have headphones or uh, earbuds that can sometimes uh, help with sound, uh, it can certainly help with any background noise that we might hear otherwise, but we can also manage um, your muting and unmuting, so we will keep you muted unless uh, folks are in active discussion. Uh, here on the screen, I think you all uh, managed to uh, navigate that because you unmuted yourself, but the, the mute and unmute is down here at the bottom. Uh, the video, it looks like most of you have your video on. Just a note, um, we really want to emphasize video uh, during this meeting for the uh, committee members as well as the facilitators and the rest of us. Uh, there are a few others of us who are in on a panelist link or as co-host and we will turn our videos off so that it really uh, focuses the video on the, uh, on the committee members and those who are actively uh, presenting or facilitating this. I want to bring your attention to this uh, participants button uh, right in the middle of your screen if you're on a desktop. If you click on that, that opens up your panelist uh, and, or your participant panel. You can see who all the panelists are. You'll, you'll see a list of all the names. You can also see who has joined us as a, a listen-only attendee. Uh, so I want to make you aware of that. And folks that are in listen-only mode, we're very happy that you are here as well. Um, you do have in the middle of your screen, you have a, a, a little hand and if you click on that hand, you can raise your hand and we will be uh, offering a public comment opportunity. And if you are interested in providing public comment, then we will ask you to raise your hand. So that is uh, coming up here shortly. If you do have any technical difficulties, please um, jot down this number before you have them so that if you do, you're able to reach Ray uh, he will be able to help you uh, manage uh, technical difficulties if you have them. And for those of you who are in listen-only mode, uh, public uh, attendees, if you do wish to provide a comment, uh, but you don't uh, want to provide it during the public comment opportunity, or if we don't have enough time to get to everyone, um, we do encourage you also to email your comments uh, to the address that is on the screen right here. It's our standard info at uh, project address, so please feel free to uh, to do that. You can also call the number on the screen and you can leave a voicemail message and that will be transcribed uh, into a public comment. I believe, Dr. Holt, those were the two reminders that I needed uh, today, so shall we Excellent. proceed? Absolutely. If you will move us forward in the slides, that'd be great. I believe everyone has in their email address a packet of today's information and we're going through quite a bit of information and so if you will refer to your packet that will help you see the agenda uh, brief welcome and introductions uh, we will talk through our principles of agreement in terms of reminding us about them uh, then we will go into the moment of moments for public comment which we have five minutes slotted for that 
and I'll bring Susan back to explain how we will go about that. And then we're going to spend some time really jumping on our values. And uh, in order to have that discussion in a robust way, we've got two presenters to contextualize what brought us into um, uh, understanding around our values. And then we'll spend the bulk of our time on the charter. The values in the charter really are to uh, help frame the work, help settle the work. One of the things I've appreciated in the one-on-ones with everyone and the ongoing continued uh, relationship establishment is that uh, everyone's asking what specifically are we going to do and how are we going to do that? What's our role? What's our voice? And we want to be very clear on what that is. Uh, it's extremely important to me that we onboard the executive steering committee correctly and that you as an executive steering committee help shape that onboarding process. And so that's what we're going to be working on today. Uh, as much as we can, we may not finish and that's okay. Uh, it's the process that we're in to make sure that we, we uh, establish what we need to. So, and then after that, there'll be a presentation of the environmental peer review uh, and its full report. So that's what's happening. We're gonna try to be um, as thorough as possible. You will see that I am in twice, um, in, the, um, in the meeting twice, I'm still not able to secure a new webcam. So I am on my iPad so that you can see and hear me. And then I've got you on my desktop so, or my um, tower so that I can see everyone else. So with that said, let's go to the next slide, please, Susan. And then the next, introductions. Again, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to defer to our chair and see if he has any opening comments. And then I will just call our names off for the purpose of roll call. Chair Simpson. Thank you, Dr. Holt. Um, just one point of clarification. I know that we're still, I think, I'm just wanting to confirm whether or not if Doug Kelsey was able to get access, given the fact that we are gonna go through introductions. Um, Chair Simpson, I have not seen him enter the, the um, chat yet. Um, Julia did get in. Um, I have emailed with mm -hmm. both of them privately, so I'll continue to work with Doug to see that he gets in. Great. Okay. Well, just a little troubleshoot, but aside from that, um, thanks everybody for taking your time out. Um, beautiful day. Obviously, I would rather be out throwing water balloons at little kids in my neighborhood, but you know, I'm going to just hang out here for the next hour and a half. and. Um, and try to help guide us through a uh, very complex but uh, very necessary uh, project for our for our Portland region. And um, yeah, I think we've uh, gone around and around and around about um, in terms of what I believe and 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 what I think is going to be really important, not only just for me personally, but also from the commission standpoint as I'm a liaison to the Oregon Transportation Commission. And, um, and one thing I wanted to just flag is that as I've been talking to um, my fellow commissioners since we're so sparse out around the state, I think a lot of them are starting to kind of um, have more interest in this, in this project, um, given the recent events that have taken place um, in our uh, political climate, as well as in our, in our communities around the country and around the world for that, for that matter. And so as there are I guess you would say uh, direct linkages tied to the history of this particular community and the things that a lot of people are feeling um, the personal need to do something about as it relates to injustices within the black communities. Um, this is something I believe they're finding more interest in, in having some kind of understanding or more importantly an update on. And so I, uh, I'm trying to figure out what's from the staff perspective what that looks like um, since we're trying to entertain what options we have on the on the table to whether meet in person or to continue webinar meetings as our as a as a commission i think we're probably more leaning towards the webinar side of it just because it's safer that way and so um i'm looking forward to this conversation because we probably won't meet for a while and in the min and in the meantime we could be um having a conversation and providing the rest of the commission an update as to where we are um, in our next commission meeting, which is in about three weeks, three, four weeks. So uh, more to come on that. But again, I, I don't want to eat up all the clock because again, this is not about me. This is about the community. It's about everybody here that's involved. And um, I'm just here to help 
like I said, play a liaison role to ensure that we can achieve the best possible project we can from a triple bottom line perspective, environmentally, economically, and most importantly, socially, um, and, uh, and show the rest of the country how we as a region, as a city, as a state actually do uh, community development projects that are truly sustainable. So I appreciate everybody's involvement. And uh, most importantly, I wanna make sure we allot adequate time for the public testimony because those are gonna be very important. So thank you. Thank you. Chair Simpson. Now we are just going to do a brief roll call as we continue through our um, ESC members. So I will call your name and then uh, give you a moment and make sure that you unmute so that you can respond. Be excellent. And right in order that is on uh, the agenda. So Albina Vision Trust. Uh, Mike Alexander here. Excellent. City of Portland, Office of the Mayor. Ted Wheeler is here. City of Portland, Office of Commissioner. Well, you daily present. Good to see you. Governor's Office. Good afternoon, Leah Horner with the Governor's Office. Good afternoon. Labor, Oregon Building Trades. Robert Camarillo, Oregon State Building Trades Council. Thank you. Metro President. Here. Multnomah County Commissioner. Multnomah County Commissioner Jessica Vega Peterson here. Good to see you. Uh, North Northeast Housing Strategies, Marlon Holmes. Sorry. Good evening, Marlon Holmes here. Good to see you, Marlon. National Association of Minority Contractors. Good afternoon, Nate McCoy here. Director of the Urban Office of Mobility. Good afternoon, everyone. Brendan Finn here. Oregon Trucking Association. Jana Jarvis here. Portland Public Schools board member. Good afternoon, everybody. Julia Brum Edwards. And I'm going to apologize this to know advance at four. I have a. Um, public board meeting, committee meeting I have to attend. So sorry. Well, I'm glad you're here. Good to see you. Try Matt. Correct. Good afternoon. Doug Kelsey here. We're so glad we're <laughs> finally get you connected. And uh, the co-chair of the Williams and Russell Project Working Group. This is Bryson Davis here. Excellent. Thank you. We can move forward, Susan. Welcome everybody. I uh, want to remind you briefly of our principles of agreement. We introduced those in our first meeting. You will be seeing them on a regular basis as we do what we do. Um, it's important, I think, for us to, to understand them and make sure that we, we function from them. And Erica Warren will try excellence if you will help walk us through that. Indeed. Good afternoon, everyone. We just want to make sure that everyone is engaged, that you feel like you are being heard. Uh, our first principle of agreement is that your voice definitely matters. So we'll want to hear from you. Please uh, don't be offended if Dr. Holt or myself calling you because we want to know um, what is your thought, what is your heart behind the matter. We want you to speak your truth. Hopefully this will be a place that we can begin to be authentic together uh, and after that, we want us to listen for understanding, make sure that we are uh, not just jumping to speak, but to listen to each other. We wanna deal with the issues and not with people. Uh, we all have varying backgrounds and grids and, and make sure that we are listening for the issues. And sometimes that will lead us to experience a little bit of discomfort, uh, but that's how we'll grow together. So you may experience some discomfort in this process. In light of that, we also ask that you would remain respectfully engaged in the process. And so we're asking for executive steering committee members, if you would keep your um, cameras on so that we can see your lovely faces on this summer day, stay respectfully engaged. And then uh, lastly, but definitely important, expect and accept that we aren't gonna be able to close everything today in this meeting. So we'll continue the conversation moving forward. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate that. Any question or comment about that from the ESC? We're all good. Thumb up. Thumbs up. 
I see two thumbs up. <laughs> All right, perfect. We'll keep it going. The next slide, Susan. Here's our moment for public comment. And Susan, would you kind of introduce that for us? Yes, I would be happy to do that. Uh, so we have a process here um, where we are asking those that are attendees, public attendees, uh, to raise their hands. So click on that uh, little hand icon so that we see that. We, I see that we have three hands up right now. So if anyone else would like to make public comment, please raise your hand. Um, we would appreciate it if you would focus your comments on today's meeting topics and uh, that agenda is available online. As each speaker will have up to one minute uh, for your comment, um, I'll give you a heads up when we're about 10 seconds out. We actually are going to have a, a timer on screen and I will uh, show that in just a minute. So you will also be able to keep track of your time, but I will give you a reminder. And then um, at one minute, uh, we'll ask you to wrap up and uh, and we'll allow you a chance to do that. But if, if you were to continue, then uh, I might get to a point where I would have to say time and then uh, we will mute you. And again, to provide more extensive comments, uh, we certainly hope that you'll look to the options that are on page two of the agenda. That would be the email and the voicemail. So with that, I am going to uh, put the clock up here. And then we will go ahead. Hmm, for some crazy reason, that doesn't want to share. Just a moment. Let me try once again. There, I think that is working that time. So I have uh, three three hands that are raised. I'm going to begin with Aaron Brown, uh, and then Aaron will be followed by um, by uh, Anna Kemper and then uh, Colin uh, Herman. So uh, Aaron, first, please. And Sophia, if you could unmute Aaron. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you, Aaron. Fantastic, my name is Aaron Brown. I'm an organizer with No More Freeways. I want all of you to take a moment to remember the first time you were briefed about this project, possibly in 2017. And I want to ask you yourself, if you knew back then what we knew about ODOT and this project, what would you wish you had said? If you were told during the public comment last spring, ODOT would ignore over 2,000 comments, 89% in opposition, would you still tacitly support this project? Because that happened. If you were told that ODOT would avoid publicly releasing the traffic projections the entire expansion is based upon, and then get caught brazenly manipulating that data when it was finally released, would you still tacitly support this project? because that happened. If you were told there'd be an international reckoning demanding not just table scraps, but meaningful holistic realignment of public investment in line with reparations for black communities, would you be signing off on a freeway expansion into the backyard of Harriet Tubman Middle School? Because that is happening. If you were told you could support Albina Vision by Second. pledging to pay for funding for billable caps without having to also widen the freeway, all of the benefits and none of the pollution, would you still support spending billions on freeways? Because I'm telling you that now. There's still, still time, I know the time's up, my final comment. There's still time to speak up. I hope folks on this committee will use this opportunity to vocally ask ODOT why we can trust them. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate your comment. Uh, Anna Kemper, let's get you unmuted. All right. Uh, hello, uh, committee members. My name is Anna Kemper, and I'm a member of Sunrise PDX. I testified earlier this month uh, to the Community Advisory Committee just a few weeks ago, noting that it was unusual to be experiencing a 90 degree day in May. And I'm back uh, testifying today, the day after a reported 100 degree day in the Arctic Circle. So while the attention of the local Sunrise PDX hub has been understandably and justifiably focused largely on the current movement for Black Lives, we're also aware that, the climate, that climate change continues to pose an extreme threat to our communities. And I wanna be clear, climate justice is racial justice. I'm hoping that the elected officials on this call will interrogate why ODOT isn't studying alternatives to spending $800 million widening this freeway. Communities of color will be first hurt by the impacts of the freeway and climate change, and including the students of Harriet Tubman Middle School, 65% of whom are non-white. Spending millions on widening a freeway instead of explicitly investing in community development is a mistake that future generations cannot afford you to make. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Anna. Uh, Colin Herring. Hello. Yes. Hello. Um, 
My name is Colin. I'm a member of Sunrise PDX as well, one of the many organizations heavily opposed to the climate destruction proposed for the Rose Quarter expansion. Um, I can't help but notice there's only one member of this executive steering committee who appears to be under the age of 40. Um, I'll only be 31 when my climate fate is sealed in 2030, that's 10 years from now, and um, expediting the destruction of our planet's, planet's climate is only going to make things worse. Um, yet that is exactly what is happening with this freeway expansion. Um, the Arctic just reached 100 degrees. COVID-19 is running rampant through the entire world. And frontline communities of the climate crisis are already facing horrendous air quality, water quality, and climate extremes around the globe. Um, the lack of youth representation on the steering committee does a disservice to young people who will disproportionately bear the burdens of this proposed expansion in the years to come. If you are not going to represent our young communities, I hope you listen to our testimony that so blatantly calls for reorientation towards investing in people and not in lands and freeway. Tense. Climate justice is racial justice, and reorientation can provide the necessary restorative justice that the Alpina Vision Trust rightfully seeks, while also helping combat the climate crisis in our city and region far more effectively to protect our future. I hope you use your seat on this committee to push it out to make the right decision. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, Dr. Holt, that would be uh, all of the folks that had their hands raised. Thank you very much. Thanks, Susan, for managing the process. We appreciate all the voices and everyone who shared your public comment. We encourage you to do a couple of things. One is, uh, of course, you can continue to email and uh, communicate that way. And then I mentioned this in our first meeting. And I will say it again, that uh, Triax Lutz is more than willing to communicate with and interact with any of the uh, public and people who are concerned about the process and possibly give some insights uh, as to how things are being done. So thank you very much. According to our agenda, we're going to uh, look at the context that brought us to our discussion around the values document. We have two guests with us today and uh, about 15 minutes collective between the two uh, to share and bring us up to speed on uh, kind of the background that went into this, this work. We have the Native American uh, discussion that was held and then several African American discussion groups um, that may shed light on our process. Let's begin with um, the presentation in regard to, or the update in regard to the Native American discussion. So, well, I believe that's me. Hi folks, William Miller here. I serve as the community advocacy manager at the Native American Youth and Family Center. Uh, thank you all for joining today uh, on this beautiful day. Um, so very high level overview of the report. The, we engaged about 13 individuals from our community um, to talk about their idea of this project, uh, input based off of uh, ancestral knowledge, ancestral ties to the region. Um, and we had folks at the table from our business community, from the Coley region, um, young folks under 18 years old who in fact attend NAIA's Many Nations Academy. We had elders involved in the stakeholder discussion group and um, many other folks who, who live and reside in the region and travel through the corridor. High level themes, many of our community folks at the table were really wanting to know um, who, who the funders were behind this project. And, and we talked about uh, House Bill 2017, but they dug a little deeper wanting to know, you know whose interests were at, were at the forefront of this discussion, who was benefiting from this, this project, given the history of the region um, as a, a low income area, as, a, as, a, as an area of, um, of displacement, and, um, and they wanted to center those who were most affected, which makes complete sense. Um, there was some skepticism of the project just based off of that, but really um, they felt that there was a lack of transparency on, on how black indigenous communities of color would benefit from this project. Some folks did mention they felt that the businesses in the region would be displaced as a result of this project. Um, and that they, they weren't fully informed um, as, as to where this project is heading. Um, there was a discussion about the need to center climate, uh, climate action at the forefront of this. We did talk about a climate, uh, climate impact statement um, and how we need to make sure in addition to that, that we're making sure our BIPOC communities are at the center of this discussion as we move forward. Uh, it was a real, real rich and lively and thriving discussion, and I felt that our communities were heard. Um, but really, the, the biggest recommendation came, that came out of it is that 
uh, our communities didn't want to just be told what was happening, rather they want to be part of this discussion, part of this process, each step of the way. Um, we call it, and some of you might be aware, the parachute effect where we come in and get feedback from community. Um, our community wants to stay in this process and up to date on what's happening, um, provide input at every step. Um, we, you know, our elders have lived in this, this area for many, 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 many years uh, and call this home. And so they, they wanted to make sure that we were not only centering our historical black community who's lived was, you know, this is, this is the region of our, our, our of people, uh, but also tie in the ancestral ties of the first peoples uh, of these lands um, in, in which we're, we're talking about today. So there was a little bit of both of that uh, in how we developed this, the vision, the project, um, but also making sure that there's full transparency not only in who's benefiting from this project, but also making sure that our communities are brought along in this project and not left behind. Uh, I had a really great time facilitating this process and I look forward to more discussion. Thanks, William, I appreciate that. Thanks for giving us that background and, and settling that perspective, thank you. Dr. Roberta Hunt. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Holt, um, I just wanna be mindful of time. So how much time do I have and do people, can people ask uh, William and myself questions? At this moment, we've got 15 minutes between the two to help kind of set the context. Uh, my hope and anticipation is that we're gonna be able to bring you back in to have more of a robust conversation, especially as it relates to the values document. I don't know if you guys have seen them prior to this work, but uh, this helps to inform uh, not only the ESC of the background process that you guys went into, but then also as the community is hearing kind of the dialogue and the conversation, I think it helps to inform all of us uh, around how we're responsibly moving forward around restorative justice as a primary work. So about six, seven minutes today, but okay. uh, we'll have the time together, so. All right, so I have about six or seven minutes. Yeah. All right, it's very good to give academics really short time. Um, so, uh, my name is Roberta Hunt. I'm really excited to uh, connect with you all. Um, my co-facilitator, John L. Bell, couldn't be here today, um, but you're in good hands. Um, so, our group, uh, we met, we did four focus groups with uh, members of the Black African American community in October. We got to work with 39 um, participants who had a lot to say um, and uh, I am going to I'll give a very brief overview of the findings but I'm really interested in the recommendations um, because the recommendations require all of you and I think um, thinking about the people that we um, engaged with they um, if this uh, if they, they want to benefit from this project and their sense, um, I think similar to what William uh, talked about with the Native American community, is that as it stands, um, they're not going to really benefit. It's not for them. Um, but they have recommendations on how they could benefit. And so, um, but for those recommendations to fly, it requires all of the um, entities here to think about what is their specific part that they could move to do this. Because for the participants, um, their overall sense was that government, and that's um, all of you, uh, is not meeting their needs. And, um, and so the opportunity is that government, all of you, can work together to make this happen. Um, so some of the uh, kind of key themes across groups, and this is from uh, page two of the African American focus group um, info that uh, was shared with you. Uh, some of the key themes um, are a recognition that congestion needs to be addressed. Some questions about, is this project going to do that? Some thoughts that Interstate Bridge um, is an, uh, another uh, major place to, to focus. Um, 
So there was limited support of the project elements as they, as it stands. Um, however, a lot of energy around the recommendations to um, enhance this project uh, in service of um, Black people. Um, that uh, this, uh, a lot of concerns around gentrification and um, a sense that any development um, could stand to, to uh, accelerate gentrification. Um, a lot of the people who participated have now been moved out of the area and can't afford to um, come back. Even with right of return policies, they've not been able to either access them or in accessing them, it doesn't necessarily address issues of belonging. Um, and belonging was a key theme um, for this, uh, with this group. Um, so some of the things that people really emphasized is that they want opportunities to build generational wealth um, and uh, think of home ownership as part of that, but also business development. Um, affordable housing is key. So whatever, you know, I think what people were wanting is um, work with, uh, for ODOT and the other partners to work with uh, Albina Vision and um, really uh, develop the um, opportunities in this area. Um, a desire for African-American owned businesses to um, benefit from whatever goes forward, but really thinking about long-term development of African-American businesses. So yes to um, MWESB contracting, but also thinking beyond that, how can African-American businesses grow and thrive? Of central concern was the health and education of young people. Um, so really thinking about Harriet Tubman School and what this could mean um, in relation to the health and well-being of the um, students in the school. Um, really this kind of no, um, uh, we can't, uh, uh, this, this project has got to support our children, not um, uh, hinder them. Uh, some recommendations uh, and some real um, energy around this. Um, people are open to moving the school. There's concern that this project is an attempt uh, by, uh, by PPS to close the school. Um, and people were very excited at the idea of moving the school into some of the land um, around Williams that was uh, taken by Emanuel Hospital and never utilized. Uh, people like the idea of turning the school as it exists now into um, a small business incubator, some kind of um, a, a cultural center, some reason for people to come back into the area. Um, and uh, people wanted to participate and they felt very much that um, uh, they were glad to be asked very concerned that their voices may not impact the process. And um, I think their voices are impacting the process, which is fantastic. Uh, and they want to be continually asked. What they really appreciated was that they were grassroots folks that um, don't normally get asked to be a part of um, the process. Uh, I want to draw your attention to, I think it is page six. Um, yeah. I hate, I hate to interrupt you, but if you just maybe two more minutes, be great. Oh, great. That's more generous than I had. Um, okay. So uh, they, they had, um, let me give myself two minutes. All right. So they, uh, on your report, it says group ideas and recommendations, page two. I want to highlight some of those. First off, prioritizing, well, it's a non-exhaustive list and no priorities but um, prioritizing home ownership for African-Americans um, through programs that take individual income and situations into account, um, specifically thinking about uh, low-income folks or um, uh, working class folks that uh, don't, don't often qualify for things. Um, uh, one idea that was really exciting was create a community land trust that prioritizes African-Americans. Um, 
prioritizing African-American owned businesses for whatever is developed on that land, um, affordable and or subsidized leases, um, food carts, business incubators, including business classes and mentorship opportunities, uh, prioritizing African-American employment, um, and really thinking what kind of long-term jobs can come to this area, um, prioritizing the health and safety of um, children at uh, Harriet Tubman Middle School, um, you know, some uh, uh, thoughts about relocating the school, um, uh, upgrading HVAC, uh, and different, different ideas related to that, but really needing that to be um, addressed. Uh, involve and have higher representation of African Americans and other people of color in this and other projects. Um, and support the creation of um, gathering spaces for uh, Black folks, um, providing monetary compensation to individuals displaced by urban renewal, and conduct a market study to determine the potential economic impact of the project and subsequent development. And one person insisted that I mention, name the pedestrian bridge after Abel Gordley. Thank you very much, Dr. Hunt. And again, um, uh, both reports, I think, are very central to uh, the ongoing work. One of the things that can happen, this is just commentary, not specifically about this project, but projects in general. One of the things that can happen is work is done through these individual groups and they never then connect or fold into the larger picture uh, two ways. One is the information doesn't get folded into the larger group who's doing work so they don't know. And or the larger group is made aware and then the others who participated in the um, smaller groups don't know. So hopefully we can resolve some of uh, each of those. And my invitation to you, Dr. Hunt, as well as to you, William, is to stay engaged in the process and stay connected, not just when uh, presenting and invited to share information, but to watch the process as, as it moves forward. I think that um, this is going to be different. It's being done differently, and I think the results are going to be different. So if we can go back to the outline, having heard that, great information. Let's talk about the values that now have been stood up. Uh, everyone on the executive steering committee, you've had a chance to look at the values. And this particular group is going to be driven, Susan, you can uh, advance that slide. Uh, this particular work is going to be driven by these values. These values are going to inform and direct the um, chart and they are going to inform and direct the work. And so beyond just being conceptual, they now become the foundation for how we do what we do. Uh, and they're not necessarily the, the following three. Uh, stood up in a way to be emphasized as priority, but the first one certainly is restorative justice. Restorative justice is the driving uh, piece for this work as so many of the committee members have articulated. Now you guys have had all, uh, you've had a chance to look through them and process them and see the new layout, which we are not reflecting here, but uh, this moment is to give the executive steering committee voice with, uh, is there anything additional that needs to happen uh, or be added within the values as identified? Uh, any concerns and or questions within the values as identified? Uh, let's discuss, open up the floor to you. Did everyone get a chance to review the um, values document? We'll set out. Yes, no, thumb up if you did. <laughs> Excellent, any commentary? Dr. Holt, I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question. And it's, it's not a question I don't, I think we can answer today. Um, these are the values that we have agreed on. There are consensus values. And we just heard effectively two reports 
I agreed with everything I heard in those two reports in terms of things that are important to the community. They talked about uh, equity, they talked about justice, they talked about the restorative justice aspects, they talked about shared economic prosperity opportunities, they talked about community investments. And the question I continue to have is whether or not all of the objectives that have been so well stated and which are such worthy objectives, things that I believe most all of us on the steering committee have talked about at one time or another, and some of us have discussed extensively, whether or not this project can deliver on all of the values that we have established as our basic values. And I think at some point, and it's, it's probably too early in this process, but at some point we're gonna to have to ask the tough question. And the tough question is, can we in fact achieve these values with the project as it's currently scoped? And what I wanna know is, what are we going to do if the answer is no? What does that mean? And I think at some point we have to be honest with the public and transparent with the public about what the expectation would be. And I'm, I'm concerned as I listen to these outstanding reports and I hear these fabulous ideas and we've solicited this input from the community. Um, we are establishing an expectation with the community that we will deliver on those values. And so I, I just wanna put a reminder out there on the table that at some point we're gonna to have to do the hard work that goes well beyond just listening or soliciting feedback and we're gonna to have to start answering the question, if we are going to include these as our values and we are gonna truly support these as our values, then what specifically are we doing in the context of this project to achieve those values? And where, is this, where does that leave us with the overall big picture of what is intended as a transportation project? And so I, I'll just say this again, I've said it till I'm blue in the face. Um, if we are not doing well by our BIPOC community, and if we cannot get support on our climate action goals from climate action organizations and advocates, and we cannot effectively address how this project and its development will share economic prosperity and address historical injustices and how it will still be an effective transportation project that meets clearly articulated and stated transportation objectives that are demonstrable to the public. If we cannot do all of those things, I believe it will be difficult to impossible for us to ultimately support this project moving forward. And so I wanna say that clearly and unequivocally right now because I'm hearing what the community is saying and I'm supporting what they are saying and I'm saying amen uh, but I want you know, I want to make sure that that we are going to deliver on what we are tacitly telling the community we will deliver and so I guess that's not really a question I'm, I'm just putting it out there at some point we got to get beyond vague generalizations and listening sessions and start having conversations that get to the brass tacks about how we're actually going to pull this off and deliver on those values. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Udaly. <clears throat> You're muted. Thank you. First, I want to thank Dr. Hunt and uh, William Miller for their presentations. Uh, I agree with everything I heard and I just want to especially appreciate the participation of our Native community, um, which, you know, not only was our city founded on unceded Native, Native land, there's also a significant urban Native American community in North, Northeast Portland, which has been largely forgotten about. And uh, I think it's important that we uh, raise their voices in this process. So 
my comments for the values document, uh, just I'll, I have a handful I'll go through really quickly. One is I would really like to see a strength in the language on restorative justice and equity based on the feedback from our first ESC meeting and in line with partner agency statements. Um, I think the language is a little too non-specific and I'm happy to share specific language in writing, but um, I'd also like to see added language related to the importance of local streets, reconnecting neighborhoods in support of rebuilding community accessibility and safety in support of mobility and climate goals. And I'd like us to revise the language from reducing congestion to increasing predictability and reliability in response to feedback from ESC meeting number one. And um, we might need a little more time to give us additional staff feedback as uh, we didn't have a lot of time to go through this document. But those are just my initial comments. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate it. Others? We do have a couple of hands raised, uh, Dr. Holt, um, Vice Chair Simpson and uh, President Peterson. Okay, in that order then. Actually, I'll defer to President Peterson and any others um, that, that have comments. Um, I just saw that there weren't many going up and but now that people are more, more are starting to become more engaged, I'll definitely defer and then I'll follow up afterwards. Appreciate it. Thank you. President Peterson. Thanks, everyone. I just wanted to follow up and say uh, appreciate the outreach um, that was done to the BIPOC community. It's very much appreciated. Um, I think uh, we're hearing similar things at Metro uh, with the work that we're doing uh, with Albina Vision Trust. So a lot of this overlaps, and I think that's part of the context that, of the setting that we sit in, is that there's a lot of other work going on as well, uh, that one project cannot meet 100% of the goals, but we need to get all of these uh, values out on the table. What I just wanted to put on the table is just the reminder that to me, this doesn't stop with the values. There are performance-based outcomes that should be specified under each one of these. And I'm hoping that that's what we will get to next in terms of what are we actually trying to see and how close to the things that we're talking about get to each one of these. So that would be my first comment is that obviously we're not stopping here. These need very specific things. And I will go back to, um, thank you, Commissioner, you daily, I um, am very much focused on uh, being more specific in the I-5 corridor about what mobility means. And in terms of mobility, we usually are focused on predictability of the movement um, rather than a free flow condition. Um, and so I would, I would just wanna make sure that we're, we're focused on the right thing. Right now it's not predictable. And what we're trying to get to is a more predictable uh, movement through that area and that changes the focus of, of how we view the perspective that we have and what we're trying to achieve so that we can actually relate that back um, to the other values that we're trying to meet as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, President Peterson. Any other hands raised? Um, uh, Bryson Davis's hand was up but then went down, Dr. Holt, so I'm not certain if he uh, would still like okay. to make a comment. Well, Bryson? Uh, no, I, I think I think my thing was covered by uh, what President Peterson just said. Thank you very much. Chair Simpson. All right, thanks as well. Um, and that was, actually I appreciate the comments of President Peterson, Commissioner Daly and the mayor uh, because they're all, they're all tied together. Um, not not much I can I can go into detail on as it relates to uh, Commissioner Daly's comments, which are, are spot on. It definitely should be more of a conversation around predictability and the predictability of the trip, just to provide more transparency to our users of the system, whether that's commercial users or 
single occupancy users, I just think that's, that's super valuable information. And given the fact that technology is helping us become more efficient in the 21st century, it's definitely something we should be leveraging going forward. So um, I just wanted to, to put that out there. But um, I'm really glad that uh, the mayor had indicated um, that these values are going to be so important and the concerns around achieving them. These uh, values right here, I think, are simple enough where I think from a, from a highway perspective, outside of the, the um, predictability piece, which I think we can find some ways to, to work some, some elements in there, but we have to also keep in mind that this is, this ODOT doesn't do anything outside of that. Now ODOT can do things to help outside of that, um, but as it relates to values and, all the, and a lot of these other elements based on these things that were identified by um, Mr. Miller and, and Dr. Hunt, um, these are gonna fall into the hands of some other agencies. And so what excites me is that what I've indicated earlier on is that now it provides us the opportunity to really start um, lifting up the hood on all government agencies and figuring out who's been efficient and who hasn't been efficient and who's been making commitments and who has not been making commitments. And then most importantly, as President Peterson alluded to, how you, um, how you install those KPMs to, 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 to hold everybody at, at accountable to what we're committing to on the, on the public's behalf. So um, I'm not gonna stand here and say ODOT can solve every issue as it relates to restorative justice, which is really just discrimination in the black community if we wanna be explicit or in the native communities. Um, which is more of a federal conversation in my mind, um, but at least as it relates to the community level, um, this does call for a great opportunity for us to get the county, for us to get the city, for us to get Metro, um, and any other public institution that utilizes public tax dollars to invest back into community to make some very strong commitments in terms of how we can achieve some transformative community development models. And this could actually just be a conduit to how things get done going forward um, through intergovernmental agreements and um, agencies working together. So um, I just wanted to mention that, but I definitely think we're getting down the right track as we talk about um, holding each other accountable for values and, and upholding and um, fulfilling these values that, that, that we overall put forward. Thank you, Chair Simpson, appreciate that. Um, was there any, are there any other hands that were yes. raised? We, we have uh, Doug Kelsey's hand is up, uh, and then uh, Bryson Davis followed, and then uh, Michael Alexander. Excellent. In that order, Doug. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And firstly, I, I'm just, thank you for allowing me to join in the conversation here today. I apologize. I'm just catching up from last Friday when I was invited to join in. So um, I, I, when I look at the values, um, the one thing I, if I go to the third one, the mobility focused, um, to the, the, the critical importance of this project, I would just suggest, should also ensure that it fits to help the, flu the overall network fluidity, that it's not just isolated. The importance of the, all the elements that have been talked about today should also fit into the fluidity of the overall network in this region and the other initiatives, whether it be off-ramps or the community, but also the I-5 corridor, as Lynn talked about earlier. Um, there's a whole complexity that it uh, it shouldn't restrict. It should be equal or add to work that's already underway. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, then we have Bryson and Michael Alexander. Build off a little bit of what uh, Alondo was saying, and kind of in the same vein as as Doug's comment. Um, you know. I think one thing we we should be mindful of in this project is to, um, you know, while we're not going to be able to to, you know, just like we're just like us at the Williams and Russell project, while we're not going to be able to solve all of the all of the issues, um, at one hundred percent with one project, um, we need to be mindful of to where uh, our project fits in with all of the other uh, related projects and how this project can support the other projects that are trying to achieve the values that we're trying to uh, achieve and how potentially this project could hinder those 
those projects and keep the, that interaction in mind um, so that um, while this project itself might not be the, the key achieving the goal, this project can support other projects that are, that are doing that work. And then we can articulate that out. Thank you. Appreciate that, Bryce and Michael. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Paul. And, and let me also thank Mr. Miller and Dr. Um, geez. Hunt. Dr. Hunt. Roberta, I call, I, you know, I can't call her by her first name now. I, I knew her before she was a doctor. Um, you always but, can. <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I, um, first of all, I, I agree uh, with the uh, comments that were offered by, um, by Orlando and, and, um, and, and the mayor. Uh, I do think that, you know, if there's anything that has sort of become increasingly clear to many of us over the last several weeks, is that we have an opportunity to really make transformative and pivotal change in many of the largest decisions that we're making. And everybody has an accountability in that. And so I, I, Orlando is spot on when he says, this is not something that can be embedded entirely in a transportation project. I do think that what we've heard from community is, is critical though, because uh, for better or for worse, expectations have been heightened as to what this can mean and what this can do. And I want us, it's important that we stay within the scope of the problem that we're trying to solve, but it's equally important that we not focus only on process, but step back and look at whether we have scoped this as well as we need to. Because I honestly believe that some of that opportunity is gonna take us beyond how we may have envisioned this over the course of the last year and a half and looking at it within a broader set of opportunities and context so that our focus cannot just be on how we get to this, but what it is that we're trying to accomplish. So knowing that we can get into that discussion, I think is gonna be critical. You know, we can't solve all of the issues that were raised, but I believe that we can solve a greater number than many of us have comfort with right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and so let me ask and not force to spend time trying to deal down into wordsmithing with the document today. Uh, let me ask that everyone review the document because there are specific aims and outcomes associated with each of those uh, values. The value statements that are in front for uh, public consumption at this moment are just the bullet points, their definitions, their aims, and their outcomes for each of those values that we've been working on. And so I would ask you to spend some time, drill down, and make sure that they are um, addressing the items that we've talked about. And that uh, whatever feedback, whatever concern, whatever thought uh, you might have, you can then respond to so that we can do exactly what has been identified by each of you that this work is um, hitting the targets. One of the exciting things that uh, I've got, I, I would just be very transparent about this particular uh, role is, it, is beyond just facilitating the meetings, it's actually consulting on the process and consulting on the project. And that's what's exciting about helping us to get to and move this work forward. And so I would invite, again, take another look. There are aims and objectives with each of those bullet points and make sure that we are communicating to the things we're communicating. The other thing I'd say is the reason why this group is comprised as it is, is because it connects to that broader scope and that broader reach with the intent of connecting the project working group and the Hill Block property and North Northeast housing strategies and the North Northeast community development initiatives work so that there's a broader uh, opportunity. And then lastly, my comment would be that the partnership uh, of the various agencies and the possibility of how that partnership then begins to collaborate with the work. So this is an exciting conversation uh, that supports uh, what's going on. And I only take the moment to communicate it for those who are listening who do not know all of the uh, strategy that's gone into this work and the various players that are participating in the process um, 
to demonstrate there is intentional listening and specific response so that um, there isn't a tone deafness of action and activity that is happening. So take a little moment just to clarify that. Great comments. Did I miss anyone at, that had their hand up or anything uh, that we were covering? So it relates to the values not. Okay, we're going to move forward a little bit and spend some time talking about the Executive Steering Committee Charter. Now, let me again emphasize the values are driving the charter. The values will inform the charter, and the charter is just to give the specific charge, the overview, it identifies the membership, a decision making process, roles and responsibilities, and then the operational agreements. Hopefully, you've had a chance to look through those. Our time today is not intended to wordsmith. It is not intended to pull apart any particular sentencing or structure. It is important to identify key themes, key thoughts. Is it specific enough in the various areas? So that's our approach today. I hope that makes sense. And then uh, we will continue to uh, drill down and expand, clarify, and be very specific around what this role is that the executive steering committee has taken on what your charges and how to execute it so that being stated are there any outstanding questions um uh are there any outstanding questions around um the the charter as a whole uh and we will just walk through each section and give everybody an opportunity to weigh in on sections of so any overarching questions or concerns as you've had a chance to review, and then otherwise we will just walk through section by section. So Susan, any hands up? I do not see any, but uh, Dr. Holt, just as a reminder, if during the discussion you would like me to stop sharing so everyone's in gallery view, I'm very happy to do that. Just let me know if you would like that to happen, uh, but I don't see any hands just yet. I appreciate it. Thanks for that reminder. I'm, I'm kind of doubling down where I've got the gallery view up on one screen and then so that everybody else can see me on, the, on, uh, uh, on my iPad. So yes, thanks for bringing that. Uh, well, then let's just kind of walk through it. First question would be, has everyone had an opportunity to review it, to look it over? No? Most have, okay. All right, for, for those who have not, that's okay. I'm going to ask for our thoughts and comments by the 30th of this month. The goal is to have uh, the values and the charter ready to roll by our meeting in July. So if we can have our comments, our thoughts, our feedback, our feedback by the end of this month, that would be tremendous for us. That's my ask. All right. <clears throat> so for those who are prepared, uh, and we'll just spend the amount of time that we need to spend, maybe 10 minutes or so. And I'll just walk us through each section. Any comments under section number one for overview? You know what? Maybe I should ask a different question. So let me not, not I don't want to force it. And I, I don't, I feel like I'm forcing it, and I could be wrong. Would it be beneficial to pause? Give an opportunity for those who would like to give uh, kind of a drill down work on the on the charter and maybe form a smaller group who just works on the charter together and then presents it back out. Would be be interested in, in approaching it that way. Feedback, thoughts. Don't everybody talk at the same time. So Lynn was unmuted, then muted. I mean, President Peterson, sorry, personal relationship. President Peterson, well, I lost her. Oh, there she is. All right, thank you for the idea. I, I think at this point we're fine. Um, we need to run it by the entirety of the Metro Council um, at some point soon. Um, so if there's edits coming, that, that's fine. We, I just wanna make sure that I get it in front of the entirety of the council. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you.
Any other comments? Brendan? No, okay, I saw you became unmuted, so I thought it might be. Commissioner Jessica Baker Peterson. Yeah, hi. Thank you. So I um no, I appreciate the the work that went into putting the um the charter together. And I think a lot of the things that I read through it are, you know, good representations. And some of it's just our basics, like who's the membership, how often we'll meet, some of those basics. I think to me the most important section or one of the most important sections um, is the charge of the executive steering committee, section two. I mean, that's really, I think that's where we are marrying the conversation that we had previously about the values and really how we want to make sure that um, what we heard from um, the different, um, you know, the different focus groups and community groups um, and, and their reports to us are really um, paired with what our charge is and the work that we actually have to do so that our values um, are, are paired with that. So I think that that's, you know, if we're going to have a, a short time for discussion, maybe that's a good point to start with, um, how our values are going to really um, tie together and marry with the, the charter of the steering committee in section two. Thank you, Commissioner. Do you have any thoughts or any suggestions in that section? Because it starts by saying that the project values will guide the process and the outcomes. And so the intent was to connect it that way. Is there anything in terms of making that a little more meaty or giving it more teeth or as maybe it's give everyone an opportunity to review section two? But um, yeah. and Susan, can you bring up the chart? and maybe section two so everybody can look at it together. I can certainly do that. Give me just a moment. Thank you. Yes, this is exactly the portion where the charge of the committee is identified. And I think this is where we want to lean in and be as, um, as uh, directive as possible. Thanks, Susan. Mm -hmm. If there's any particular part of that, let me know, or uh, I can I can zoom out and make it uh, some more can fit in, of course. If you could just um, make sure the last part of um, number six is showing, that's great. Yeah, that's fantastic. And again, as you review, my question would be, what is missing? Is there something there that needs to be articulated? Not from the standpoint today of wordsmithing. It's not what I'm asking us to do. Uh, my ask is to make sure that this speaks to the charge of the committee and that this committee is uh, comfortable saying, here are our commitments and uh, our investment. So is there anything missing that you would add? Any hands up? I didn't see yes. any. Yes. President, there, President there. Peterson, sorry. Yes, Hi. and then and then Nate McCoy. Okay. Um, Dr. Holt I, and uh, committee members, I guess I'm just looking at this in relation to the um, mayor's comments of the scope um, and the comments that we just heard. And um, I, I guess I'm, I'm struggling with how to bring those uh, as Commissioner Vega Peterson just mentioned, I, I'm struggling of how to bring the values and performance outcomes into this uh, statement. I don't see it. Thank you very much. Nate McCoy. So my comments were somewhat similar to Lynn's. Uh, I mean, if we're going to be tasked with making some recommendations and kind of guiding the values and ultimately the outcomes, one big indicator that I heard earlier from both the two presentations was economics. Um, and I think all of us could agree on this call and certainly Metro would know better than most that we have a huge workforce gap right now um, on the construction side. And I just got the latest report and data from Boley that says that out of 10,000 people, 
there are about 329 Black people and 283 Native Americans in the current pipeline uh, in the non-union and programs. <laughs> we have over $5 billion in construction opportunities coming from five to 10 years from now. And I just don't know where the data analysis is for us to actually see how some of these values line up with outcomes. Um, so for me, I just would love to see more data conversations to help us inform what decisions we make moving forward, like Metro has done with some of their C2P2 efforts. Um, so please share with me, either Dr. Holt or others on the, on the uh, committee, on how we actually stop just having conversations and actually look at real data to help inform decisions. Thank you, Nick. Any other comments around the charge? Shanna. Thank you. I wasn't sure if there was a hand raise option on this screen. I can't find it. So I appreciate you noticing that I raised my hand. Um, I, I'm curious as well in terms, I know we've had a lot of discussion with this project relative to the community that surrounds that section of freeway, but we haven't had much discussion about the users of that section of freeway and if there's going to be any discussion about the impacts um, to the rest of the state who are users of that system as well, and obviously others outside the state, but specifically other communities around the state that depend on that section of freeway for um, getting goods to market or being able to, you know, travel through that area or whatever. So I'm just curious to know how that would fit in with what, what our goals and objectives are. Thank you, Jenna. That is in the mobility section as it is defined and then the objectives that are uh, further identified speaks uh, specifically to connectivity of I-5 broader region statewide as well as uh, West Coast. But anything missing that needs to be added, here's our opportunity to make sure we're capturing those pieces. So points well taken. Any other comments around section two? It looks like President Peterson's hand is back up. Hi, President Peterson. Um, Dr. Holt, I'll just volunteer. Um, we've got staff listening, and I'm sure that we can craft some language to add to the charge that brings these pieces um, of the values and performance outcomes back in. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. That was the other question I was going to be saying, who, who would like to participate, who would be willing to, to participate in the process? As we I volunteer us. <laughs> Thank you, President Peterson. And so uh, I'm asking for everyone to take some time. Uh, and this is draft. This is what the executive steering committee will uh, drive. And so uh, all uh, points taken. And so feedback and uh, ownership. Excellent. Any other comment at this point? I guess I'd like some clarity on kind of the powers of this steering committee because I'm reading language, informing, advising, recommending. Um, I've got to be honest. I know I, uh, as well as everyone else on this call, have a lot of responsibilities and demands and I didn't sign up for this to recommend things that may or may not, I mean, not personally, you know, as the committee recommend things that may or may not be incorporated by or honored by ODOT. I appreciate that. Section number four, decision making. Oh, sorry. Well, I guess <laughs> uh, all the language in section two kind of set me, <laughs> set me off. So I will retract those comments and perhaps um, restate them later. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. So what we will do in interest of time, uh, I'm gonna ask everyone on the executive steering committee, spend a little time with the chart, mark up, pull up, uh, write up, uh, all things that are concerned. And you are the decision makers for how this charter gets shaped and what is in it and the direction it goes. 
uh, in light of the values that are being set up by you um, to inform and, and direct this process and to reflect the concerns of the community that have been articulated, uh, the information that we've heard, and how it connects. This is what you do. So, and I'm here and we are here to help however we can, make sure that we stay on point and give um, insight, parameters, and some uh, feedback as we go forward. So thanks for your time. We're gonna to move to our last item on our agenda. Uh, Dr. That, Holt, pardon me while I move there. Uh, Michael Alexander had his hand up as well. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Holt, I'm, I'm sorry. The, we, you were asking what's not here, and, and maybe a, a chart is an appropriate place, but I am very interested in how the charge of this group and the timing on decision making for the project intersect. I mean, yeah. we've got we've got scheduled meetings for the next 12 months. Yes. Uh, you know, what I'm trying to sort of disavow myself of is the thinking that we may well come up with a very elegant path forward and the window of opportunity would have been opened and closed twice during that time. So I, I just wanted to get a sense of whether the charter can speak to where timing on project, design work and other things intersects with the work of this group. Thank you for raising that, Michael. You and I talked about that individually and my commitment. Part of it will fit into charter. Much of it fits into, as you just identified, um, beyond the scope of work, which gets defined in charter, as well as, um, I should say, the, the scope of, of the, the charge of this committee is defined in charter. The work and the application is to make sure that there is a shared timeline, that the meetings line up with decision points, that you're well informed in advance where uh, the input and decision making needs to happen so that what we don't have is what you just identified. Uh, by the time that the executive steering committee has come to its, its points of, of insight and reason that we've missed windows. And I don't know, Brendan, if you want to weigh in there or, or Megan, uh, either of you. Yeah, no, I just would say that we're very cognizant of that, uh, Michael, and, and something we probably need to, again, have a, another discussion on. I know we've been talking a lot about it. We don't, our full intention is to not have missed those opportunities or to have this work um, do that. So maybe that's something we need to, to articulate and have ready for the next meeting and, and have a discussion about beforehand, just so we're all, we're all clear on the timing issue. Great, thank you. And I think there's information we can get to you in advance so you can read in terms of timelines so that you're aware of at least what is projected as things stand. I think that would be good too. All right, we've got an independent, we've got a um, peer review and a presentation from it. Grace, you are here. We want to uh, give you some moments to do that. Uh, thank you for your patience. Thanks for participating, being in the entire meeting. Grace, I'll let you introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Grace Krennikan. Um, I'm the former general manager of BART down in Oakland and San Francisco. Uh, used to be the head of ODOT for five years, was the deputy at the city of Portland for seven years. So I'm old, been around per earlier conversations about having old people on the call. I'm one of them. Um, and the, Dr. Holt told me to be brief, so I'm going to skip through this. And if you have questions, we'll either take them now or later. I'll be happy to. But uh, just to get it out on the table, uh, a peer review panel was convened. I'll kind of skip the panel and the process unless that's important to someone asking a question. Uh, the conclusions that the panel drew, they, they were in charge of looking at air, noise, and greenhouse gas, uh, and the charge came from the Oregon Transportation Commission, and we were asked to look at the environmental impacts, excuse me, the environmental assessment to determine whether uh, air, noise, and greenhouse gas um, methodology analysis and proposed mitigations were appropriate. Um, were adequate. And uh, the, the conclusion of the peer review panel is that the, uh, the study was conducted in accordance with the federal and state rules and regulations uh, in this regard. And uh, the panel didn't find any problems with what ODOT came up with in terms of their conclusions. And they came up with appropriate mitigation measures that are called for in the environmental assessment. Um, they uh, did a uh, a, a good job in terms of the technical analysis 
I'm getting some feedback. Is there any problem hearing me? No, I can hear you fine. All right, thank you. Um, so they did they did a great job following the rules and regulations that they were supposed to follow. I said I would say the committee said they didn't do a great job in either noise or air in communicating the technical information they found to the public. So they got dinged by the committee for not being great at connecting the good work they did, if you will, on through to the report. That said, uh, no one uh, to a person recommended that any more time be spent trying to do further analysis in the EA, nor did anyone recommend that they ought to go on to the environmental impact assessment, uh, impact statement. So an EIS didn't seem warranted to anyone on the committee. Um, and <clears throat> so cleaning up the language, uh, better articulating the information that was found in the technical report, bringing it through was there. I want to address Harriet Middle uh, School. It was mentioned Harriet Tubman Middle School, uh, and I'll do that at the end. Um, but uh, the peer review panel did recommend that further analysis be done on the construction phase. And ODOT, uh, two of my, three of my panelists uh, have experience in California where the CEQA, the California Environmental Act, has you do the construction impact assessment with the project. Oregon does not. It's very legal and appropriate what they do here. But uh, they thought that what was important is that as the community, as ODOT began to focus on the construction phase, they as quickly as possible do the assessment of the construction process. Um, and um, they noted that in the EA, early on, ODOT articulates the violations that occurred to the Black African American community. I don't think Native community was mentioned up front, but it might have been. I don't remember that part, but um, that the violation was done years ago, um, and they didn't carry that information through, but they did a good job uh, on what they analyzed. And so um, <clears throat> it's important as you move into the construction phase that that awareness ODOT did show of the violation that occurred when the freeway went in in the first place and split the community in half, uh, that they, they go back in the construction phase and do it right, if you will. Um, and uh, everyone on that panel has experience and knows what a pain in the butt construction projects are for the agency, but they also know <clears throat> that it's hellish for the local community. So in the end, the through traffic uh, on I-5 will benefit from this project. The local neighborhood will benefit because it does look like there's trips that are taken in the local area that um, should probably be on the freeway itself. So they will benefit from the traffic, but the burden of that construction project in terms of the noise and everything is gonna be on that uh, adjacent community. Uh, there is, of course, impact on people being delayed for the project itself, uh, as was mentioned earlier, I think, by one of the other speakers. But um, so <clears throat> um, that pain that's there needs to be documented, and the construction impacts for noise and air and greenhouse gas can be significant, but there are ways to mitigate. And per the conversation about getting specific, uh, if you read the report, there are plenty of suggestions in there about that phase of the project and how to do it in such a fashion uh, that would allow for um, uh, a better, more kind project, if you will. I'll go through that in a minute, but I want to say that the committee noted that the, the, the construction needs more attention, that restorative justice possibilities are there. Uh, we frankly didn't know the work of this committee at the time, so we spent a little bit of time drawing that out. Um, and that uh, use of a, we recommended use of a community, a community benefits agreement to cement everyone's commitment. And, and uh, we also noted that, um, you know, there's auditor, you can assign an auditor that would provide an annual report that shows that uh, the uh, Metro was supposed to do this, the city was supposed to do that, ODOT was supposed to do this, Albina Vision Trust was supposed to do that, and who did what they said they were going to do, and it, you can put it out there, you can have an ongoing, uh, accountability, if you will. Um, so also, uh, there are a whole list of things that can be done in a construction phase, things like, and, and that can begin on the restorative justice side of things when you have such a massive project that too was already uh, mentioned here, but on to the construction, there's electric equipment that's out there, there's quiet construction equipment um, that get at greenhouse gas, that get out noise, 
it costs the ODOT more, but it can be justified and you have to work with your federal partners to make sure that they're going to pay for that. But it's gotta be put in the bid documents. ODOT can't come back and say, hey, it wasn't, you know, nobody responded with that. You've gotta make it a part of the requirement. ODOT seemed very open to that. I don't know where they are today, but they were, they were quite helpful uh, as we pursued that. Utilization of local businesses, DBEs, MBEs, black businesses, native businesses. You can make those, uh, requirements, but you can also uh, have active programs. There are national examples of that um, uh, where you can make sure that uh, the people that are in the community get the jobs doing the work. Educational campaigns for, for families so they understand the benefit of the project. Job training programs that can last in not just construction, but transportation um, are part of uh, some of the specifics that are there. An ongoing complaint process. You need to have an automatic feedback um, with the community and it's not something that works eight to five on Mondays. The project is going to, you know, go not some nights, uh, some weekends, you need to have a complaint office. There's an example of New York city, which is an outstanding process. So the community has a way to log in their, uh, issues as they come up and be addressed as they come up. Again, if you have a printout of what the calls were, what the response was, you can figure out and hold ODOT accountable to these, um, issues. There are things like noise attenuating blankets. Um, I'll be quick here. The last two things I want to say, um, one is from the committee. Um, the Harriet Tubman Middle School, the, the work that was done analyzed, we have people on the committee that know modeling and everything, um, largely because of the work that the school district already did to help with the, uh, the air filter system and the noise investment that they made. And the fact that the project itself um, actually improves air quality compared to a no build uh, makes it makes the mitigate the only mitigation that was for that middle school a noise wall and there is a recommendation in there that if the school district and ODOT could reach negotiations if you move the noise wall a little closer to the school off of ODOT property but with the school district's cooperation up the slope you can probably provide uh, more mitigation for both noise and air quality to the school <clears throat> and at a cheaper price because the wall doesn't have to be built as high if it's moved further up the slope. I'm not gonna go into any more that's in the paper. One last observation is mine, uh, not the committee. And that is uh, the ODOT's project is not just a freeway project. ODOT has a project by putting a lid on, uh, they call a cover over it. Um, they're doing, they did the environmental assessment on not just, if you will, their project, but on the, a project that's the city of Portland's project on the lid. So they're actually, in my opinion, um, doing more to, they're analyzing what would be considered a mitigation in any other state that I know of. I would have killed to have, uh, I'm not killed, poor choice of words, but to have WashDOT when it was the head of Seattle DOT cover up that I-5 freeway in the city, and there was no interest on their part. So the fact that they've put the cover on it already, in some cases, the cover would have been the mitigation. So as you do the, um, as you do the project, I think that's the first step that they've taken toward what I would consider a piece of restorative justice to try and bring the community back together. Um, and so, um, so we, we give them a little bonus point for that. Um, that doesn't take Thanks away from some of the other things that, that are there, but it's a better starting place for the community to begin the project. I'll stop, Thank Thank you, Dr. Hunt. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, as you can see, very thorough uh, report, uh, much information that goes into it as well as with all of our other presenters. Uh, today. So thanks to everyone, uh, William and Dr. Hunt, Grace, for being with us today for the work that's in front of us. Questions from the Executive Steering Committee uh, related to Grace's presentation. Any questions? I do not see any hands, Dr. Holt. Oh, I do, actually, Commissioner Udaley. Uh, thank you. I don't think we have enough time for me to share all of my feedback and concerns so can i email everyone i'm absolutely okay absolutely yeah great and dr holt i raised my hand as well i i 
and, and again, I don't remember, and you may well have sent out this report. I don't remember receiving it. it you did not get this report. Okay, because that, yeah, it, I, I appreciate it, and, and Grace, that was very helpful. The struggle that I think some of us will have is that, you know, the good is going to be the enemy of the better on a number of the recommendations. And so I'd really like to have the opportunity to read through it in greater detail. We can make sure everyone has that. We will make sure everyone has that and be able to spend some time thinking through it. Uh, a link was sent to the peer review report to the full executive steering committee. So you have a link. Yes. So if you all will um, search your emails for an email from me sent out on June 18th, it should have uh, that link uh, to the uh, peer review. And if not, I'd be more than happy to resend it to the entire committee. Let's do that. Let's resend it so that it will be just right at the top. Of, of everyone. I, I thought that we had taken care of that. Perfect. Yep. Any hands? Susan? Uh, that uh, is it, uh, Dr. Holt. I do not see any other hands. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for your time today. And as you can see, 90 minutes flies by. Um, my hope is to not burden us with too much content. I'd love to get your feedback on that. And I want to give us enough time to, to discuss the items we need to discuss. So if I'm clear, I think we need to spend some time on values in terms of outcomes and expectations. We need to spend time nailing down the charter to make sure that the, the um, charge makes sense. And it's, it's clear and clearly communicated. And then it sounds like there's a desire to spend some time and begin to drill down on, on the reports, or at least the, the information we've heard from the uh, people who came to the, the, the meeting today. Is there anything I missed or anything you would add? Dr. Hold, I don't believe you missed anything. I just want to reiterate for those initial um, revisions and comments We'd love to have some of your input by the end of the month, by June 30th, uh, so that we can begin the review process um, in order to have some things back out to you in a reasonable time prior to our next executive steering committee, which will be Monday, July 27th. And you can look for those uh, um, responses and interactions coming from us. And so if you would uh, kind of like make a mental note or anything that comes from Tri Excellence, we will not, we will not, we will not flood your inboxes with uh, emails that are not necessary, relevant, or pertinent to our work. That I promise you. So, thanks everybody for your time. I appreciate it. We were a little late uh, getting going, so technically we we're a little under ninety minutes for our meeting. But uh, I want you guys to have a great day. Thanks, Enjoy. Doctor. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Enjoy your evening. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care, everybody.